Well, hello there, land lovers, and welcome aboard for a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. This is the only show on the whole internet that I'm personally aware of that lumps six movies into one theme and makes a whole season out of it. And would you believe it? This is season 19, a scrappy collection of carbon copy movies emulating the success and usually the plot of one of the greatest action films of all time, Die Hard. Suitably, we have titled this season Die Hard Ons. If this is your first time with us on these high seas, let me list the amenities you can expect on this journey. First, my oldest friend Chad Cooper will be regaling you with stories of high adventure in the world of movie making. Then, I'll be back to pick the barnacles off this soggy adventure film, do some dumb voices, and navigate the plot in search of castaways of entertainment. But, enough of the introducing, let's do some podcasting. Sit back, pour yourself a salty dog, and enjoy our take on Speed 2 Cruise Control. Take it away, Chad. <clears throat> All right, let me take off my N95 mask so I can speak more freely. Much better. And we are back. Hello, hello. Happy New Year to our first intern of the year 2022, Susan from... Syracuse. Welcome to Pick 6 Movies. Susan, what are you studying in school? Audio engineering. This is the perfect internship for you. A um, few questions before we start the intro here. Have you ever seen the movie Die Hard? You've seen all of them, Susan? All right, I believe you. Let me ask you this. Have you ever taken a cruise? You took a what now? And when you say a Star Trek cruise, that means. And that's where you got your first Star Trek tattoo. Absolutely. I want to see them. Well, the ones you can show me, I don't want to get in trouble with HR. All right. Oh, I did not expect to see a tattoo of Leonard Nimoy. Take up your entire outer thigh. Look at that. All right. What? You got one on your shoulder. Hold up your forearm. I can't see it from here. What is that? I was unaware that Vulcans had their own form of calligraphy. Does that mean anything? Uh, and when you look at that tattoo, do you, in fact, make an effort to live long and prosper? Do you have any tattoos of uh, Chewbacca or... <laughs> See, Susan, that, the fact that you would tell me to go F myself to my face is why I respect you, Susan. That's why I said we need Susan as our intern, even though I could remember what college you're currently going to. Was the Star Trek cruise a success, Susan? You got engaged on that cruise. Oh. Okay, you met your wife on that cruise. Susan, you and I need to spend more time outside of normal working hours, getting to know each other better. I want to hear more about this Star Trek cruise and the fabulous time you had meeting your future wife and all manner of Star trek -y adventures and weirdness. All right. I can only assume you had a wonderful time on your cruise, Susan, because there's only two ways to experience a cruise. One is a fantastic, fun-filled adventure on the open seas, and the other involves a terribly tragic trip where things go sideways in unimaginable ways. And movies featuring cruise ships are no different. Susan, give me some vacation theme music, and I'm gonna tell everybody all about this. Movies set on cruise ships really go one of two ways. You're either having a really good time, or you are not having a really good time. If you're looking to have a good time on a cruise ship in a movie, you can't do any better than the Marx Brothers 1931 classic monkey business, in which the four Marx Brothers are featured in their very first movie, specifically written for the big screen. In the film, the brothers are stowaways on an ocean liner bound for New York, and it's filled with all kinds of different shenanigans. One storyline involving the romancing of a bootlegger's daughter, and separately there's a storyline that involves the aversion of the attentions of a gangster's girlfriend. If you're looking for some tap dancing hijinks, you can enjoy Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers as they set sail from Paris to New York in Shall We Dance? If you'd rather watch Fred Astaire dance his way from London to New York, you can check out Royal Wedding. 
Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell, they set sail to Paris and gentlemen prefer blondes. Now, once you get over there, you can book a return trip back with Cary Grant and Deborah Kerr in an affair to remember. Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau play a couple of dirty old men pretending to be dance hosts and out to sea, marking one of the 10 pairings of these two actors on the big screen. It's basically grumpy old men part three, but set on a cruise ship. Speaking of comedic pairings of actors that take place on a cruise ship, we cannot forget Academy Award winning actor Cuba Gooding Jr. and Saturday Night Live alumni Horatio Sands teaming up together in the film Boat Trip, where a vengeful travel agent books these two heterosexual men on a singles cruise that's filled with wah, wah, gay men. <laughs> I'll bet that movie is quite the good time. Speaking of movies set on a cruise ship that you should never see, there's Adam Sandler and Adam Sandler in Jack and Jill, where Adam Sandler plays the titular brother and sister, Jack and Jill, who are also twins. Guess who else appears in this movie? Oscar award winning best actor Al Pacino. How have we not reviewed Jack and Jill on this podcast? That is a very good question. I will work on an answer. Somehow we made our way from the waters of enjoyable cruise-themed films into the realm of big ship disaster nightmare movies. This looks like a good place, Susan, to change out the music so that we can talk about disaster movies set on cruise ships. Eh, something more ominous. Oh, not that ominous. What is that? All right, that sounds like cruise ship disaster movie music. Let's go with that. Go ask 100 people to name the first movie that comes to mind when they hear the words cruise ship disaster movie. And almost every one of them will immediately give you the same answer. Alvin and the Chipmunks 3, Chipwrecked. But then they'll say Titanic, as directed by James Cameron. The movie broke box office records and awakened the sexuality of a generation of teenagers thanks in part to the wispy haired heartthrob and heir to the Jack Nicholson throne of sexy actors Leonardo DiCaprio. Titanic had Jack and Rose and that necklace that the old lady threw in the water and there was an iceberg and Billy Zane's permanent eyeliner. Who can forget that night to remember? which was also the name of the 1958 movie, A Night to Remember, that was also based on the Titanic sinking, but that movie had none of the stuff I just mentioned in James Cameron's Titanic, except for the iceberg. Now, as especially disastrous as Titanic is as a movie, I believe that the 1972 tidal wave cruise ship flipping high seas nightmare, The Poseidon Adventure, is the greatest cruise ship disaster movie ever made, mostly because Gene Hackman and Ernest Borgnine spend most of the movie telling Shelley Winters how fat she is. Their ridiculing of this actress's size is beyond the pale, even for the levels of acceptable misogyny of the early 1970s disaster movie. The Poseidon Adventure begot Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, which was a direct sequel to the original film, and it turns out to be a heist movie with Michael Caine, Telly Savalas, Sally Field, Jack Warden, and Slim Pickens. Pop quiz, what do those five people all have in common? Answer, they've all appeared on Pick 6 movies. There was a remake of The Poseidon Adventure in 2006 with Richard Dreyfuss and Kurt Russell, and I know what you're thinking, did I see that movie? And the answer is yes, but you don't remember any of it. Horror movies hack their way aboard cruise ships. Among relatively recent entries is 1980's Death Ship, which features a mysterious ghostly freighter that crashes into a cruise ship and the survivors climb aboard the freighter to discover it was a World War II Nazi torture vessel. As if there's any other kind of World War II Nazi vessel out there. Not to be confused with Death Ship is 2002's Ghost Ship, which has a fantastic opening sequence where a thick metal wire snaps on the ship's upper deck, whips across the dance floor, bisecting all of the passengers and crew, leaving a small girl alive to be revisited by this nightmare scenario every time her head hits the pillow at night and she closes her eyes. Jason Voorhees hitched a ride on a small cruise ship as he made his way to New York City in Friday the 13th Part 8. Jason takes Manhattan. A group of armed hijackers boarded a luxury liner in the South Pacific Ocean to loot some treasure. But they ended up doing battle with a man-eating sea creature in 1998's Deep Rising. But amongst all of this chaos and mayhem, there's one movie that combines the hopeful optimism and romantic charm of feel-good cruise ship movies with the 
especially disastrous, adventure-infused, and calamitously ridiculous hallmarks of an Irwin Allen movie. I'm speaking, of course, about the one and only Speed 2 Cruise Control. If we're going to talk about Speed 2, which we will, it's best that we turn to the most reliable source of information known to man, The Simpsons. Here, Milhouse Van Houten described the movie Speed thusly. It's like Speed 2, only with a bus instead of a boat! Now some of you out there may be thinking, Chad, I never saw Speed 2 or Speed. Could you elaborate on the plot of the original Speed a little bit more? And for that, we once again turn to The Simpsons, where Homer Simpson summarized the plot of Speed thusly. I saw this in a movie about a bus that had to speed around the city, keeping its speed over 50. And if its speed dropped, it would explode. I think it was called the bus that couldn't slow down. And Homer pretty much summed up the plot of the movie and the bus that couldn't slow down is a pretty awesome name for a film akin to the classic movie titles snakes on a plane or pen and teller get killed but the bus that couldn't slow down wasn't the original title for the movie speed it was originally titled minimum speed and it was about a bus that couldn't go over 20 miles an hour and it drove in circles around dodger stadium in los angeles with the movie's ending involving the bus crashing into the hollywood sign the original screenplay for Speed was written by Graham Yost, whose father was a Canadian television big shot. And Papa Yost told his kid Graham about the 1985 movie Runaway Train starring John Voight. Now this was a movie that was loosely based on a concept by Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa. Look, everybody rips off somebody else, get used to it. Hell, this podcast is a mashup of Joan Rivers' Fashion Police, Siskel and Ebert's At the Movies, and the comedy stylings of <laughs> Rich Little. So the younger Yost decides to rip off Runaway train and Kurosawa's premise for a movie, but he's going to swap out the train for a bus and add a bomb to jack up the suspense. A close friend told Yost that he needs to ramp up the bus's speed from 20 miles per hour and make it 50 miles per hour. Rumor has it that the Red Rocker Sammy Hagar was that friend, uh, as he was by his own admission incapable of driving 55, but a citation is needed for that thing that I just made up. Yost writes his script, and the whole movie is set to take place on a public bust. Yost goes to Paramount Pictures, and they give the movie a green light to move forward. And guess who studio executives asked to direct the movie? None other than John McTiernan, director of the original Die Hard. John McTiernan considered the offer, and he said, no. This is just Die Hard on a bus. Why don't you go ask my director of photography, Jean DeBont. He worked on Die Hard and Leonard Part 6 with Bill Cosby. And he worked on that sequel to Romancing the Stone. I don't remember the name of it. Look, he's probably available. The studio executives over at Paramount Pictures were very disappointed when John McTiernan rejected the offer to direct the movie. And the studio had said, If we can't get John McKinnon to direct a runaway bus movie, this project's dead. Call Yost and tell him his script is shit. He'll never work in his town again. Also, get Bill Cosby on the phone. I'm headed to the Playboy Mansion, and I need some of his goodnight bunny candy. Also, call my wife and tell her someone I know died, and I'm going to be at the funeral for a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> so the script for Speed heads over to 20th Century Fox, the studio that distributed the original Die Hard. And Fox agreed to make the movie, but their studio heads had a few conditions. First off, we can't have a movie where the only goddamn action takes place on a bus. Have you been on a city bus? It's full of winos and prostitutes and failed screenwriters. We need to have a volcano or a tiger, spaceship filled with ETs and Yodas and other weird looking shit we can turn into toys and sell. You can't sell buses. This goddamn ridiculous. Give me everybody's favorite script doctor and all around great guy, Joss Whedon on the phone. I love that guy. He's the tits, I tell you. Is it just me or do all of the studio executives in Hollywood sound alike? It's not just me? Okay, I'm just checking. So that's what happened. Currently disgraced and former television movie hotshot, Joss Whedon was brought in and he spent three days punching up the script, although he's not included in the movie's credits. Paul Atanzio, who wrote the screenplays for Quiz Show and Donnie Brasco, he came in and did a little nip tuck on the script as well. But according to the original screenwriter Yost, it was Whedon who wrote almost all of the movie's dialogue and arguably tightened up the characters and beats of the movie's plot. These changes included swapping out a twist
list that Jeff Daniels character, AKA Keanu Reeves partner in the film. Well, he was supposed to be the movie's real bad guy. And they switched out the storyline to where the villain of the movie was actually located far away from the action of the runaway bus with the bomb on it. This new villainous role was ultimately filled by one of cinema's greatest nut jobs, Dennis Hopper. To play the heroic lead in the movie Speed, the studio executives, when the movie was back at Paramount, they wanted Jeff Speakman to star in the movie. Who is Jeff Speakman? He was in what? I've not seen The Perfect Weapon, or Street Night, or Deadly Outbreak. Like a martial arts expert? He sounds like he sounds like a poor man Steven Seagal, which is what I call a Jean-Claude Van Damme. All right, we'll talk about it later. Let's get back to Speed 2, but on a bus. So when Speed took an off-ramp from Paramount over to 20th Century Fox, the movie really started getting some notable names to star in the movie. Stephen Baldwin, Tom Cruise, Wesley Snipes, Woody Harrelson, Tom Hanks, yeah, right. But the lead role ultimately went to Keanu Reeves based on his performance in the surfer bank robber movie Point Break. To play the movie's female lead, Annie, filmmakers originally wanted Halle Berry. She said no. Then the filmmakers considered ramping up the comedy and making the female lead more of a comedic sidekick. And currently disgraced television host Ellen DeGeneres was considered for that role, but that didn't work out. Ultimately, the part went to Sandra Bullock fresh off her appearance in the film adaptation of the comic book Demolition Man, starring alongside Sylvester Stallone. Studio executives got their extra action sequences added to the beginning and the end of the movie by way of an opening elevator sequence and a finale set on a subway train in Los Angeles. Much of the movie's pulse-pounding action was filmed on stretches of inter State 105 and 110 that were not yet open at the time of filming. The sequence in the movie where the bus leaps across two stretches of unfinished bridge work was conceived during scouting for the film locations. And years later, those two science killjoys over at Mythbusters went on to explain how this jump is impossible according to the laws of physics. Thanks a lot, Jamie and the other guy whose name I can't remember. Speed hit theaters in June of 1994, and thanks in part to my ticket purchase on the movie's opening weekend, the film debuted at number one and ultimately went on to pull in a collective box office haul of $350 million on a budget of an estimated 37 million bucks. Audiences loved the movie, critics loved the movie, roly poly sweater vest film critic Roger Ebert gave the movie four out of four stars, his best rating possible. Rotten Tomatoes currently has the movie at a 94% freshness ratings. Studio heads at 20th Century Fox were thrilled at the success of Speed. <laughs> Give me the studio head at Paramount Pictures on the phone. Hello? Yeah, it's me. I just called to rub it in that your dumb shit really passed up on a gold mine of a movie. Suck it, Paramount. Also, I called your wife and told her that you were lying about that funeral a few years back when you visited Hef with your Cosby drops. Good luck in divorce court, asshole. Also, by the way, we're making a sequel, dickheads. But not immediately. Jean Debont went on to direct the tornado thriller Twister, a movie that was a giant box office success, so much so that it inspired a theme park attraction at Universal Studios in Florida. Debont was riding high and was looking for inspiration regarding his next big movie, and it came to him in a dream. Well, well, more of a reoccurring nightmare if we want to be more accurate. Debont had this ongoing dream where he saw a cruise ship crashing into an island and felt this could be incorporated into a sequel to the hit movie Speed. Devont was very open about his affinity to destroying things that looked to be very expensive and destroying a luxury liner uh, crashing into a luxury hotel or small village sounded like a real hoot, a very expensive hoot. Screenwriters Randall McCormick and Jeff Nathanson were brought in to craft a screenplay around the spectacular nightmare finale born of Jean Dupont's reoccurring sleep visions of epic destruction. The movie's villain would be an ex-employee of the cruise line who computer hacks the ship's navigation system so he can crash the boat into an oil tanker. All right, whatever. And coming along for the ride would be Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock's characters from the first movie, because of course they fell in love after that movie ended, but there was a problem. Keanu Reeves didn't want to make the movie. 
He'd been making other action films, including the movie Chain Reaction, and he wasn't too hip to all of the proposed underwater action sequences. Years later, Keanu Reeves admitted that in addition to those reasons, he didn't make the movie because he thought it didn't sound like a very good premise for a sequel. Once Keanu was a Keanu, filmmakers brought in a facsimile of the actor by way of Jason Patrick, fresh off his turn fighting vampires in The Lost Boys and doing a lot of cocaine in Rush. Sandra Bullock was 100% on board for the sequel because <laughs> why not? Her part was bigger, her star power was growing, audiences loved her, and her career was on the upward swing. People Magazine's Creepiest Man Alive for the past 37 years, Willem Dafoe was brought in to play the movie's bad guy, and Jean Dubont wanted all of these actors to perform their own stunts to give the movie a sense of realism, which they did, resulting in Sandra Bullock almost getting her head cut off by the rudder that was attached to a 459 foot long ship used for filming, aka the Seaborn Legend. Jason Patrick got thrown off a motorcycle in one sequence and landed in a tree, where he came to rest off the side of a cliff. Bullock admitted that this stunt should have killed Jason Patrick, and Bullock was also quoted, at the time of making the movie, we've all done some stuff that people shouldn't be doing. Well, Sandra Bullock, I think that's true of all of us, whether it was on film or not. Sandra Bullock and Jason Patrick reportedly spent hours treading water, just hanging off the side of the ship, producing hours of footage that resulted in seconds of on-screen film time. The ship used in the movie, The Seaborn Legend, was booked for six weeks to make the film. And during this time, a hurricane showed up, tossing the ship all about. Jean Dumont did admit that he gave the film actors time outside to go vomit between takes, which, hey, that's classy, right? Filming was further plagued by an inept captain that was incapable of crashing boats in the St. Martin Harbor when he was supposed to hit them during filming, resulting in delays of the shooting. But the one sequence in the movie, you know, that cruise ship crashing into the hotel in the village, that was a moment that Jean de Mont refused to not capture perfectly with practical effects. That's right, practical effects. Despite the advancements of computer-generated images and digital technology at the time, Jean de Mont wanted to crash an actual ship into actual buildings for the movie's finale. So filmmakers built a replica of the cruise ship and the town in which to crash said cruise ship. Carpenter spent six months building a jetty in St. Martin where they created a one-third scale model of the Seaborn Legends prow, which weighed about 300 tons. It was powerful powered by four diesel engines. And these carpenters also built 35 buildings that were gonna be crashed into. Now, remember that hurricane that I was talking about earlier? It came in and severely damaged the entire set, which had to be rebuilt. It is to date one of the grandest and most expensive practical stunts ever captured on film, costing an estimated $25 million for the film's five minute finale. That means every second of the movie's finale cost over $83,000, holy shit. Speed 2 wrapped up filming with a budget of reportedly 110 million to 165 million bucks, depending on who you ask. But even at the low end, Speed 2 had a cost that was three times the budget of the original Speed. Speed 2 Cruise Control comes out in theaters. It didn't do nearly as well as the original Speed, maybe because a cruise ship travels around 25 miles per hour, half the speed of a bus with a bomb on it. And speaking of bombs, Speed 2 Cruise Control was a huge bomb. It's got a 4% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's praised as being one of the worst sequels ever made. Sandra Bullock said that she knew the movie was going to stink during filming, but hey, that check had already cleared and was in the bank. Oddly enough, the aforementioned amateur Al impersonator and Pick 6 movie's favorite film critic, Roger Ebert, who is a man that clearly had a crush on Sandra Bullock or alternately smoked a huge joint before seeing Speed 2, gave the movie three out of four stars, citing it as a rousing ocean liner adventure story and i'm hungry for pizza are you hungry for pizza or donuts we should order five pizzas and get donuts speed 2 grossed only 48 million bucks far below its production cost and is one of the biggest box office bombs of all time losing between 40 and 70 million dollars the movie was nominated for eight razzie awards out of the 12 categories available yielding the second highest number of nominations that year right behind batman and robin which had 11. it didn't take home the award for razzie's worst picture of the year that honor went to Kevin Costner's The Postman, but it did take home the Razzie for worst remake or sequel. Good for you, Speed 2 Cruise Control. Good for you.
but is speed to cruise control really that bad? Or as Roger Ebert claimed while exhaling a cloud of Cincinnati gold pot smoke, that good of a movie? Well, there's only one man I know who can answer such a vexing question, and that's Mr. Bo Ransdell. So let's head down the gangplank and call all aboard as we set sail into a movie best described as Die Hard on a cruise ship. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, land lovers, and seamen everywhere. That just sounds gross. It's 1997's High Seas disaster speed to wonk wonk cruise control and welcome to pick six movies i'm chad cooper and i'm joined with my first mate and bestest little buddy mr bo ransdell bo how are you doing this evening i'm giving it all she's got captain <laughs> and it turned out crappy this is our third movie in a row that is a sequel to a movie that is a diehard ripoff but only two of them are in the diehard on season the other one uh -huh. that was christmas time is here that's something else it's some totally different yeah completely different season right just the same thing i just wanted to start off do did you like the original Speed? I don't remember the original Speed. I mean, I think I liked it all right, but never enough to watch it a second time. I saw it the one time not long after it came out, and that was kind of good. I saw it in the theater. I watched it a few years ago with my son when he was young and i gotta tell you my kid loves all things transportation like boats and trains and planes that's just his thing and when he was little he was obsessed with titanic so we watched speed two with him and then he was like hey i see that it's speed two is there a speed one i was like yeah we can watch that so we watched it <laughs> it's like a speed two only with a bus <laughs> so we're watching speed one things are going okay until the end of speed one when keanu reeves hoists up dennis hopper and his head gets lopped off by the subway train signal and my son like he'd never seen anything like this it was like when the dalai lama saw that footage of whatever world war in seven years in tibet like how have these images made their way into my head i didn't know this was a thing that could happen and my wife and i were like nah, chalk that up to some bad parenting the number two on our list of bad parenting as it relates to movies was we watched Shaun of the dead with him and we were all having a good time until all the zombies started ripping that guy's guts out and my kid was yeah. like i'm out i'm done he doesn't have that weird constitution like you where he kind of gets off on that he's like no see you later yeah i don't know that constitution <laughs> is the right word i think i was trying to be kind don't worry about it it's fine <laughs> I've, i'm old enough that i'm self-aware i understand it's a problem would this movie have been better if keanu reeves had returned for it no the problem with the movie is that nothing happens and i don't care about any of the characters <laughs> i like keanu reeves just fine in certain movies like those john wick movies he's great in he's great as neo in the matrix movies but it's not because he brings a aura of compassion or empathy into those roles it's just i like those movies he would not bring any additional gravitas to this movie he might be prettier to look at than jason patrick but you know you can make that <laughs> argument all day long better philosophers than i have debated <laughs> whose chiseled looks are more powerful the jason patrick or keanu reeves no i don't think it, his presence would have made it better maybe a little bit more logical in terms of why is Sandra bullock on this boat with this yahoo maybe but even then you're still saddled with a movie where nothing happens and you've got a shitty villain like as you pointed out in the introduction in the first movie you've got world-class cinematic weirdo dennis hopper uh-huh being like daddy wants his bus <laughs> and he is phenomenal <laughs> Dennis Hopper is wonderful in everything he was ever in. You know, you've got Willem Dafoe, who's a great actor. Cinematic weirdo in his own right. Yeah, I mean, look no <laughs> further than To Live and Die in L.A. for a great performance uh, from Willem Dafoe as a villain. But there's just nothing for him to do in this movie. There's nothing for anybody to do in this movie. I do think that Jason Patrick feels a little bit like the stepmother of the Speed franchise. <laughs> He's like when they slipped in that new Darren and Bewitched where you're like, wait a second. That ain't the guy that I, I remember. You're not my daughter, Becky. Oh, wait. Yes, you are. <laughs> 
The thing I like about Jason Patrick, by which I mean the thing that makes me laugh can't, and makes it uh, impossible for me to take him seriously. <laughs> Go on. Is that he always looks like he's right on the edge of a sneeze, where he, his <laughs> eyes are kind of squinched up a little bit. And he's, eh, yeah, uh, yeah, all right, Sandra. But, uh, 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 okay, uh, no, 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 it's fine. Lost it. That's both a good feeling and a bad feeling. Because you're like, it's just going to come back. Or maybe not. Yeah, let's get confessional. I like it when I sneeze on the toilet. Really? Yeah, I love that. I feel like something could just blow right out of me. Like, I could lose a spleen. <laughs> let's talk about this movie. We start off in the camera speeding <laughs> over the open water, so we know we're in the right theater for a movie about a cruise ship. But then it transitions to a road speeding along, and we get the title of the movie, Speed 2 Cruise Control, where our foe Keanu Reeves, a.k.a. New Mommy, Jason Patrick, is zipping along, and he <laughs> comes into the frame on a motorcycle cycle giving chase after an ice cream truck on a winding road on the california hills jason patrick is not only in hot pursuit he's throwing in some sweet wheelie moves Bo, to show you how badass he is on his motorcycle or maybe he doesn't really know how to drive a motorcycle and this is just inept control of a motorbike it seems wildly impractical well he's chasing an ice cream truck how fast is he gonna go i think those things have a governor on of like 21 miles an hour so they don't run over a kid also there are empty boxes just barreling out of the back of this thing Thing. you're jumping the gun don't spoil it for the listeners who haven't seen this cinematic classic by the way <laughs> you should never watch speed 2 cruise control if you've never seen it this is one of those movies like i like to warn people up front where it's like hey if you've never seen invasion usa for example uh-huh then hey uh, go ahead and throw it in if you can find it it's a weird dumb crazy movie but it's never not entertaining well you can't find it anywhere i know because i had to buy a physical <laughs> dvd of that to review that movie i got one of them too <laughs> sales for invasion usa skyrocketed that season <laughs> of pick six because you and i both bought one maybe we need to make an invasion usa too we increased sales by 200 percent over the last <laughs> 10 years guys <laughs> <laughs> did richard lynch die what happened <laughs> up ahead in this chasing there's a roadblock being headed by Joe Morton. Welcome back to Pick 6 Movies, Mr. Morton. We last saw him in Justice League and Justice League uh, Snyder Cut as Cyborg's dad. Mm -hmm. Jason Patrick, he does catch up with this slow-moving ice cream truck. And there's a dump truck that's coming towards the both of them on the other side of the road. And it pushes Jason Patrick off the road. And then we get some more wheelies. It's all very exciting, Bob. I like the fact that Joe Morton is talking to Jason Patrick on his walkie-talkie or his CB or whatever. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He's like, hey, Jason Patrick, under no circumstances are you to do any stunts. Cut to Jason Patrick doing a stunt because <laughs> he's a rebel, Chad. We got to Sandra Bullock taking her driver's test with comedy legend Tim Conway. I applaud that the filmmakers made the choice in not providing any context to what is going on or who any of these characters are. Because anyone who paid money to see this movie in the theaters knows Sandra Bullock's character from the first movie. And she's a real flibber to gibbet. And they also know that Keanu Reeves is not in this movie, so we don't need to really explain, at least at this point, why this isn't Keanu Reeves chasing an ice cream truck doing wheelies, being run off the road by dump trucks or whatever. But she does anyway, because uh, I mean, the whole joke of this, right, is that she's a terrible driver and is driving too fast and dangerously, uh -huh. and Tim Conway is just doing his Tim Conway thing of looking beside himself as all this is going on. That's a pretty good bit. He made a career out of just kind of looking to the left and right look i've got nothing against tim conway at all i think he he can be very funny at times so this is not a tim conway attack jerry seinfeld pointed out that don knotts built an entire comedic career on a sniff <laughs> that's true uh but also looking scared don knotts is in the hall of fame of looking like he's about to shit his pants <laughs> who else is in that R richard pryor obviously mm -hmm. yeah who else let me think marty fell but he's not really trying yeah that well that's just due to a condition jack benny but his is a little more subdued i mean i he might be a runner-up but he's not on mount rush no i don't think so you know knots and prior really that's your neck and neck for who can look the most scared for very different reasons well one one is more cocaine related and then you've got richard prior zing yeah that's comedy folks <laughs> that's why he was sniffing so much bro <laughs> <laughs> well, just got a little toot in the pocket. Hey, hey. Andy, what? Ange won't let me 
<laughs> it won't let me put it in the gun. So Sandra Bullock is also here explaining to the audience why Keanu Reeves is not in the movie. Yeah. Where she's like, he got me pepper spray for my birthday. Yeah. And I thought it was perfume and I ended up in the emergency room. And Jason Patrick, when I drop a napkin, he picks it up. He opens the door for me. I have these real abusive neighbors. He went outside and he yelled at them. And I'm like, whoa, 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 Sandra Bullock. This is a yellow flag. <laughs> like, and then, <laughs> then she follows it up and she goes like, and guess what? The other night we were watching a video and he let me pick it out. I'm like, he let you pick out the movie you're watching? You have very low standards. <laughs> that yellow flag may be turning red real quick. Sometimes when I get him the beer that he likes, then he doesn't yell at me and he's just a sweetheart like that but she also says well you know the relationship with keanu reeves didn't work out because he had too much good stuff going yeah. on in his life he was busy making other movies and also she says relationships based on extreme circumstances are no good which is a thing that'll come into play later in the movie do you really think keanu reeves gave her pepper spray and she thought it was perfume because i was like i got a feeling you're the kind of gal that's snooping around looking for what he bought you as a birthday present and she just sprayed herself in the face and that's her story she was going through his keys yeah. and seeing if there was anything she did recognize and accidentally gave herself right. a little bit of the everett mcgill from under siege 2 she's a real needy nightmare of a girlfriend in this movie which we'll get into all that here over the next hour or so tim conway then asks her like oh does your boyfriend drive like this and she's like oh no he's completely different he's kind of boring he does say to her right right and then sandra bullocks takes a hard right from the left hand line Lane, causing a major traffic accident where this work truck carrying large panes of glass just crashes into a light pole in a building and they don't stop they're like fuck that that's not me i'm out of here Zoom! you know what i realized uh, about a year ago is that i don't give a shit about car chases in movies ever there is one exception to that and i named it earlier with to live and die in la to live and die in la has an amazing car chase in it but i don't generally care about them and i especially don't don't care about a low stakes car chase like this yeah where it's just one car causing havoc I, I don't find it interesting that's a moral failing i'm sure there was a whole lot of you can keep all this in this movie but it starts like that and that's never a good sign where you're like i don't give a shit about jason patrick chasing this ice cream truck and i certainly don't give a shit about sandra bullock riding around in her volkswagen thing causing accidents behind her the volkswagen thing the car of quirky characters if you ever need a character to be quirky the volkswagen thing preferably yellow or orange or lime green you pick your color the only way that this scene could be interesting for me is if the level of mayhem was ratcheted up behind her so that people are legit losing their lives and flames are going everywhere that kind of mm -hmm. thing like i need to be almost a naked gun level of chaos behind well, she's her. really killing people but yes absolutely <laughs> and tim go well i've got to mark that off you just murdered somebody you know for what it's worth a six pack of beer and the original gone in 60 seconds you can't do better or not. Yes, that's fine, but if you're going to ask me if I would watch it just for the sheer joy of it, eh, probably not. Our ice cream truck is speeding along and all of these boxes that Bo mentioned earlier, thanks a lot, Bo, they all start tumbling out <laughs> and it kind of looks like barrels and Donkey Kong and then Jason Patrick, he's zipping on his motorcycle, probably on one wheel or somehow no wheels, <laughs> hovering above them and then we come back to Sandra Bullock and she's failing her driver's test alongside comedy legend Tim Conway. Sandra Sandra Bullock says, tonight is our seven month anniversary. I'm like, seven months? That's a weird anniversary. Like, I can see six months. That's half a year. Uh -huh. Or like, this is our year anniversary. But seven months, unless you're a teenager and this is your first boyfriend or girlfriend, celebrating a seven month relationship feels a bit desperate. It's a weird landmark in a relationship. It's like if you're still measuring your child's age in months when they're like six. <laughs> you know, oh, Jimmy's 58 months. Like, what? That's a weird way to put that that here are two car theme scenes collide together as jason patrick catches up with the ice cream truck which runs off the side of a cliff and then jason patrick he falls off his motorcycle but on his way down he pulls a gun on the driver of the ice cream truck who's also fallen out of his vehicle so these two slide down the embankment and then sandra bullock and comedy legend tim conway they pull up in her quirky yellow volkswagen thing and she comes to a stop when she crashes into the side of a police car mm -hmm. and then jason patrick just marches up the side of the hill and he says hey it's my girlfriend sandra bullock how did the driving test go baby the joke is her saying um not great and tim conway holds up a big clipboard that has a 
ex yeah. are on the paperwork to let you know that he is not happy with her driving and oh not at all this launches into the whole deal where sandra bullock is pissed off at jason patrick because she thought he was this bike cop on the venice beach and he's like well it's not what it looks like which his case is not helped by a guy walking by clapping him on the back going wow you're a madman <laughs> oh let it go jason patrick all right there's no way the chief is ever gonna put you madman jason patrick on beach patrol that's something you would never do you probably you're gonna get yourself killed someday recovering stolen computers for a cop usa or something hey don't you go falling in love and getting in a serious relationship that woman's gonna be so sad when you die in the line of duty eventually all right see you later buddy how many times you get shot today zero that's a record usually it's one two three times you get shot one of these days that's gonna nick an artery and you're gone but so he's getting checked out by the emt because as mentioned before he went rolling down a hill to arrest this guy sandra bullock is like i can't believe you lied to me you kept from me that you were this crazy cop you didn't tell me you were on the suicide squad the what there's a suicide squad on the lapd right i was like where's king shark is idris elba gonna show up i'm thinking this sounds like a group of cops suffering from extreme ptsd it's like i doubt that these are the crew that's chasing ice cream trucks around looking to get a bunch of boosted electronics the suicide squad is called in to see why billy lost his lunch money at the emerson <laughs> elementary school like this does not seem high stakes i can't handle the pressure shards i can't do it you can do it just go in there and find out what happened to billy's lunch money i'm not gonna do it no 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 <laughs> everybody back off you've got so much to live for i think they have push-ups in there you say so sarge i'll take it one day at a time so jason patrick and sandra bullock they kind of walk off and sandra bullock she's real pissed off and she says do you remember how i told you i used to date Keanu reeves in the first movie and it ended because he was always getting hurt and i said i would never date anybody ever again they refused to be in the sequel but the producers found you who kind of looks like Keanu reeves if you squint and did you think that you should tell me that you were this crazy person and you were going to somehow not be just like Keanu Reeves in the first movie but those people were paying attention would totally think you're Keanu Reeves is that what you thought was gonna happen and he just kind of schmoozes her he's like oh hey baby I mean uh, I I know I was gonna tell you tonight in fact I'll give you my little surprise right now no it's not in my pants <laughs> it's these <laughs> cruise tickets guess what we've been dating for seven months and I'm gonna surprise you with a vacation you didn't know was coming <laughs> that's not fair you can't do that you can't just surprise somebody with cruise tickets like that that's not how surprises work but sure enough ding, 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 cut ding, to ding, the ding, cruise ding, ship ding, ding, we get our first look at willem dafoe as he's climbing on board the ship and he's got a pretty glorious mane of hair it is a pretty good mane of hair it reminded me yet again of like you know what i should watch the lighthouse again because there is nothing quite as fun for me as watching willem dafoe drunk on lamp oil almost fucking robert pattinson and if you haven't seen the lighthouse that's a thing that happens in that movie and it's why it's great note to self never watch the lighthouse oh it's so good you love me lobster he says jason patrick and sandra bullock they're riding on this little tender that's taking them out to the big cruise ship and as you said willem dafoe is there and he's got his pointy facial features and his grinchity grin which speaking of which that's the man i wanted to see steal christmas from the who's and not jim carrey oh willem dafoe as the grinch you don't have to put any makeup on him just let him run around <laughs> in the santa outfit oh it'd be so good jason patrick and sandra bullock they board the ship and they get their photo taken by dante the ship's photographer he is on this ship a lot but he doesn't really do anything he he actually calls after them chat as they pass by because he's like the ship photographer or whatever and they're like yeah yeah we don't want a picture and as they're leaving the scene he's like remember my name is dante i'll be around later at the end of the movie <laughs> you're like what <laughs> all right thanks dante as they head down to their stateroom the ship's equivalent of a bellhop he's this stateroom attendant his name's ashton he's escorting them down the hall Hallway, and he says the ship has five decks a b c d and e you're on deck c there's a spa and a beauty salon and a casino and then willem dafoe just pops out of his stateroom scares the shit out of everybody he's like you there getting quite upset have you found my golf clubs yet i need my golf clubs i said like, well calm down sir first of all I'm, I'm calm um we're gonna find them right after i take these fine people to their stateroom jesus christ give me some lamp oil and somebody who might be batman in the future that i can fuck <laughs> all hopped up on lamp oil oh my god it's so good <laughs> anyway then we 
cut to the bridge where the first mate retcon Boba Fett, Tamara Morrison, is like, so we uh, here on a boat. We're about to take off. And uh, Captain, just go ahead and give the word. And so the captain is like, all right, we're ready to launch. And we get a look at our fancy computer for the ship for the first time. Sandra Bullock and Jason Patrick are topside where the ship's getting ready to set sail. And there's this party going on. And then across the way, Sandra Bullock, she's chatting it up with Willem Dafoe at the bar. And she grabs a couple of drinks and she takes one back to Jason Patrick. And she says, hey, you want to go play shuffleboard or you want to go down to the room room? And Jason Patrick says, mm, yeah, room room. What's your new boyfriend say about that over there? These two should not be together, let alone getting married, because that's his end game. He wants to propose to her on this crew, but their whole relationship is built on lies, jealousy, petty complaints. These are the small fissures, Bo, of a relationship that lead to irreparable cracks in a marriage, or so I've been told. The trick is never tell the truth. This is when Jason Patrick shows off his detective cop skills. Yeah, Sandra Bullock is like, oh, um, that guy over there, I was talking to my new best friend, uh, Geiger is his name. Name. but he goes by willem dafoe it's so weird and jason patrick is like yeah he's not much of a golf fan i mean he won of those golf clubs real bad but then look there's this whole tournament going on right behind him on the tv and he won't even turn around and look at it i'm a detective i detect that's what i do i'm on the suicide squad two guys the other day saw a guy in a football jersey never once looked at the game killed themselves right there just because you like to do something doesn't mean you want to watch someone else do that same thing i enjoy drinking a beer i don't want to watch another person drink a beer that's no fun you know the pornography industry is really built around that idea that hey here's the thing i like to do and i would like to see a bunch of other people do it <laughs> Well, you just undermined my whole theory. Well, I'm not saying every case. I'm just saying, uh, you know, it was a realization of like, oh, pornography, the whole, it's a whole business of just like, hey, here's the thing I enjoy. I want to see other people do it. Perhaps better. Sandra Bullock is a little drunk and she gets Jason Patrick to dance with her on the upper deck. As the ship set sails, everybody's having a good time. We cut to Willem Dafoe's room and he produces two jars of leeches. Mm -hmm. Then he unscrews the caps of his golf clubs and inside them are these James Bond villain brand bomb timers to blow things up and the golf balls are bombs maybe the club shafts are full of wires to make bombs it's all so evilly ingenious Bo. i wonder if you just couldn't have thrown it in the luggage you know this was all pre 9 11 nobody was checking for bombs and shit he could have walked onto this boat with a bunch of c4 strapped to his chest they're handing out shotguns later just to the passengers to have fun with right <laughs> hey, hey here's a gun random passenger <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that this level of intrigue is necessary, but it, again, it goes to that diehard ripoff right. thing of like, you've got to show your villain being super clever. And this is about as clever as he ever gets until spoilers later, he gets a Nintendo Power Glove that's pretty cool. <laughs> Did you anticipate that Willem Dafoe would have other members of the crew working for him? Just anything would have been interesting. Because <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> right. It, like, he's got his golf balls with 3.5 millimeter audio jacks in uh -huh. them. And he's got a very well-labeled fiber optic converter. And at the end of the scene, you just see him kind of bring up the same software that we saw in the earlier scene on the bridge. So it's like, oh, he knows something with the computer stuff on this cruise ship i guess yeah, he taps into the computer system so he can take it over yeah we then cut to sandra bullock and jason patrick at their dinner table eating with a few other couples cast by a bunch of actors and actresses from the 80s and 90s including but not limited to colleen camp who was the sexy french maid from clue she's there mm -hmm. and her character works at this weight watchers knockoff called fat busters and mike haggerty is her husband i know him as kurt russell's best friend from the movie overboard mm. and then patricia Darbo is there. She was on the soap opera Days of Our Lives as Nancy Wesley for over two decades. And then she's also there with Connie Ray, who is in a whole bunch of stuff. And the point is, they're all at dinner. And it's this rogues gallery of annoying people. And they're yammering and jamming their faces full of food. And Sandra Bullock and Jason Patrick are just kind of looking on with mild disgust. While UB40 plays in the background to remind you that this was filmed at a time when we all thought that maybe reggae music was going to happen as a cultural thing. How sad was it? that UB40 had fallen on such hard times that they were working as a cover band of their own music. <laughs> 
on this ship performing I Can't Help Falling in Love with You. Yeah, they were opening for Doug Henning, uh, who was doing a little bit of magic <laughs> after they were on. Jason Patrick is looking around the room, doing his detecting, like, oh, let me see if I see any other criminals on board the ship tonight. And he sees this young girl named Drew, we'll learn, who is doing American Sign Language with her parents. She's signing the lyrics to the song I Can't Help Falling in Love with You, which, is she totally deaf? Can she hear the beat of the music? I don't know. Whatever. And then we have the cruise director come out yeah. and, by the way, played by Lucy from Twin Peaks, uh-huh. which was the one time in the movie I was like, hey! And then everything else reminded me what a tragic mistake I've made yeah. every pretty much major decision in my life. But the cruise ship director gets up and she says, hey everybody, who wants a peek at a multi-million dollar jewelry collection? And then a bunch of Barker's beauties walk around showing off fancy diamonds and necklace while UB40 sings some other song that nobody's ever heard of except for the poor jackasses that bought the soundtrack to speed to cruise control. You know, the one thing that I think I would enjoy watching less than a car chase is somebody walking around to show be some jewelry that i can't touch or have jason patrick catches the eye of drew and he starts signing to her my name is jason patrick and then drew signs back oh for a moment i thought you were keanu reeves but then i looked a little closer and realized you are not him then i thought you were patrick dempsey Or maybe Rob Lowe, or possibly one of those lesser-known Baldwin brothers, but you weren't any of those people. And then Jason Patrick signs back, no, I'm Jason Patrick. I was in the movie The Lost Boys with Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. And she says, I didn't see that movie. What else have you been in that I might know? And he says, I was in Sleepers. That was a movie about child sexual abuse and the Catholic Church and the movie Rush about two undercover cops who end up doing a lot of cocaine. Your parents may not have let you watch those movies. And she says, no, they didn't. Would I know you from anything else? And he says, hmm, a lot of people don't know this, but my grandfather was famous comedian Jackie Gleason. He was my mom's dad, and my dad was Jason Miller, who was the priest in the Exorcist movies. And she says, I don't know what any of those words mean. It was nice to meet you, Jason Patrack. <laughs> and Sandra Bullock sees all this going down, and she's like, oh, is she asking if you're Keanu Reeves? Who the fuck are you signing to? <laughs> <laughs> what is she saying? What's that little bitch saying? Hey, I've got some sign language to you. Here! And I got another one here. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Subtitles. That was my middle finger. She asks him, <laughs> how do you know sign language? And his response is crazy <laughs> because it's not, oh, my cousin had a hearing problems or uh-uh. somebody in my family. He says, oh, I want to learn a different language. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> all right. Well, that seems like an odd choice, but I guess. <laughs> and she says, well, what did she say? And, and he says, oh, you know, she was asking if I was Keanu Reeves and how how she might know me and she's like oh did you tell her that there's no way she would know you and he's like yeah we got around to that also she said that you were very beautiful and our kids are going to be beautiful is she an oracle does she know that i'm pregnant am i pregnant have her come touch my belly is she magic is she one of those deaf people does she have a, a sixth sense because one of her other senses is bad one of the people at the table is like oh did i hear someone say kids and sandra bullock says well kids are on the menu but i guess it depends on who's ordering what what does that mean i don't know i thought it was a cannibal joke and then i was hoping that the fine young cannibals are going to come out to back up ub40 but that didn't happen oh we should be so lucky that (laughs) roland gift would stroll on stage but then jason patrick says well how about i order a la carte and she says well i you know i guess it all depends on if you're in the right section of my restaurant you're like what are you two talking about (laughs) this is the worst flirting i've ever heard in my entire life maybe i'll just ask for a doggy bag to go well maybe i'll leave you my number on the check only it's not really my number it's gonna be 
Susan, who's working the section beside me, it's a little game we play with each other. Maybe I'll call that number and I'll ask Susan for your number and then maybe she'll give it to me. Yeah, maybe so. But maybe then I have to tip out the bus staff. <laughs> All the women at the table see Jason Patrick signing to Drew about his career-ish. And they all kind of are goo-goo over him. Like, he's handsome and he can sign to a little girl. Oh. At this point, Jason Patrick, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a wedding ring. And he's kind of fumbling with it, like down near his butt cheek. And he's going to propose to her. But because of all this conversation about having kids, he is like, mm, I'm not really ready to marry her. So he sticks it back in his pocket. Well, and also Sandra Bullock is like, if we were going to have kids, how fucking crazy would it be to have that discussion right now after seven months? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll just pocket this. I'm feeling seasick. Yeah. And also, I think I fucked up buying this ring so i'm gonna go upstairs to the deck and throw it over the side or something yeah but he doesn't get to do that because he gets so sick he just staggers down to the room and she follows after him and then we cut down to the lower deck and we see willem dafoe and he makes his way into the engine room where he breaks the glass on a like a uh, yeah it, it, well yeah the, those sprinklers work because if there's a fire it melts the wax and which releases the sprinkler essentially right. so he just cracks that wax and then the water just spews out everywhere uh -huh. and then willem dafoe runs over to the computer system because all of the employees on the ship just scatter and he plugs into the mainframe or some other bullshit make him up movie computer nonsense so he's he's in bo he's in then maybe my f second favorite willem dafoe thing in the movie is he wanders onto the bridge and just acts completely drunk uh -huh. hey where the hell's the casino i'm here to gamble a little money you sons of bitches <laughs> who's a guy gotta fuck around here to get a glass full of lamp oil <laughs> right and boba fett is like um look you uh you can't be up here this is uh the bridge of the boat so i'm gonna ask you to leave <laughs> and then he stumbles around and slaps a transponder up under the ledge of one of the computer desks at one point he clickety clacks on a keyboard i thought that kind of meant something but who knows yeah and they're like would you uh would you like a some help back to your to your room are you a bit too drunk to make it on your own i got it i got it get your goddamn hands off of me and then he does you know a real kaiser sozi as soon as he walks out of the bridge you know he's back to his old self and goes to some door where he punches in a code to get to this comly satellite room thing and this is where he sets up all his little golf ball mini bombs and then he goes back to his room where he has ripped out the ceiling tiles to run a bunch of power cables to his room. And at some point, like, were it not for all him taking over the ship and whatnot, somebody would be like, hey, how come, like, room 332 is using 18 times more electricity <laughs> than the bridge of this ship? So because of this comm link that he stuck up under this shelf up on the bridge, he can now hear what the captain is saying to the rest of his crew, like walkie talkie. We cut over to Sandra Bullock and she's with Jason Patrick, who is asleep. And we see that he's just puked all over himself and into a champagne bucket. He's so handsome. It's so gross. They're watching Lolita, which is a weird pick <laughs> for this movie to be like, wait a second. In this movie where Jason Patrick has this kind of creepy relationship with this deaf girl as we'll see later uh -huh. that lolita is the movie we're gonna watch all right whatever you say yon debont we head back over to willem defoe's stateroom and he's now attaching leeches to his body where he says you take care of me and i'll take care of this ship saka, 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 saka. i wouldn't trade you leeches for all the doctors in the world which is probably a thing that willem defoe says a lot which one of you beauties wants a little nut and honey yeah you know what i'm talking about about that <laughs> who wants to make a tootsie roll <laughs> i'll bet you do you <laughs> and all right so the next day this is what we referenced earlier where <laughs> jason patrick is just on the deck with a shotgun shooting skeet they don't do that anymore bo they don't just hand out loaded weapons <laughs> on cruise ships these days if you're wondering good to know have we ever talked about on this podcast how when we were in middle school we took a course on gun safety and at the end of it they let us shoot shotguns out behind our middle 
school? Yeah, I never did that. What? Yeah, I mean, I, I took the gun safety course, but when it came time to shoot him, I was like, I don't really want to shoot a shotgun. I did. And I hit my... It was just because I had my eyes closed. <laughs> the problem was I had killed a bird with a BB gun about a year before, oh. and it fucked me up man like i was like i don't want any part of guns ever again hmm. and to this day i've only had them pointed at me <laughs> by other people and myself i'm on the suicide squad i'll tell that kfc story another time but so jason patrick is up on the side of the ship just boom blasting skeet or sandra bullock wakes up to find jason patrick gone she gets up and wanders around the ship looking for him and he comes up behind her and finds her and she is totally pissed off at him and she says oh you've been looking for me well maybe you should have looked in the bed where you left me where did you go it's like, I, I went outside to shoot some guns and some targets and clear my head. So I do. You know, I really enjoyed taking care of you last night because you were unconscious and I got to do whatever the fuck I wanted with you. That was the first time that you seemed vulnerable and I really liked and I watched you while you slept. I put a steak knife to your throat. Maybe I did stuff to you. <laughs> and then I thought you were going to propose. I, I thought how crazy that is because I don't even know your cop number. And he's like, cop number? What are you talking about? There's no such thing as a cop number. She's like, your badge number or whatever. Yes. Yeah, shithead <laughs> why'd you say the first one cop number Man, the cop number badge number i got that that makes sense i guess commitment is the last thing that either of us need right now and he's like look i don't even know the meaning of that word i mean really i don't know what commitment <laughs> means if is that about ice cream i was chasing ice cream truck earlier i thought maybe that was anyway cut back to our porter ashton <laughs> Who enters Willem Dafoe's room all unannounced to clean the place up uh -huh. and sees his big tangle of wires hanging out of the ceiling and all the computer shit that looks important. That didn't look right. Yeah, and he's <laughs> like, oh, I thought you wanted me to come clean. And he's like, I distinctly put the do not disturb sign up. So now I'm going to disturb your skull. It actually said, please clean room when I walked up. Wait, what would you say about my skull? <laughs> ah! And so Willem Dafoe knocks him out with, I guess, the one real golf club that he kept. It's just a timer. It doesn't have a bomb in it. You need the golf balls to make them active. So he puts on one of those little, like, one earbud headsets and swipes Ashton's suit. I was wondering where he got his little sailor outfit. I think he takes it from him, but then later I think Ashton has it. It doesn't matter. So Willem Dafoe has his little ship's uniform on and he's wandering around. While meanwhile, Boba Fett is like, uh, Captain, I think uh, we're <laughs> off course in our uh, path on the ship. And there's this Irish maid uh -huh. that they've got with him as well, who's like, Faith in Begora, Captain, he's right. And, and the captain's like, wait a second. First of all, I really appreciate the fact that we've got a multinational crew up here. I just want to say for the record, I'm glad that we've got people from New Zealand. We've got people from Ireland. Uh, let me ask one question. Are either of you drunk? And if not, why not? <laughs> Willem Dafoe is listening in to this conversation. He, he basically is mouthing the words as he is forecasting this conversation they have about, you know, the captain saying like, well, we need to send someone to check the main frame and it's probably human error there's also a scene where sandra bullock she's painting her toenails and then there's a knock on the door and she waddles over on her heels so she's not gonna mess up her toe job and it's uh, jason patrick and he's now wearing a tuxedo and some chuck taylors and he gives her a fancy dress because earlier she said i think we were underdressed for dinner when they had their fight about whether or not they should have babies and get married or whatever mm -hmm. and jason patrick says uh, you know what i think i really like to boogie with you which i think it just means he wants to have sex with her and she smiles the way sandra bullock does in movies he's like i can't be angry with you get in here we're gonna boogie for a little bit which is code for they're gonna have sex and then willem dafoe is wandering around and he's dressed in his little porter's outfit and he sees the captain of the ship and he says hey captain if you're down here then who's steering the ship oh yeah it's me <laughs> i spent years making computer systems for ships just like this one and then i got pushed away you suck captain and then he just chunks the captain off the ship the best part of that scene is with will dafoe is giving him his villain spiel uh -huh. and the captain just goes what are you talking about who are you i'm the villain in the movie speed two this is a movie what are you talking about how many teeth do you have in your mouth it's clearly more than 80 right and they're so tiny it's like you only have baby teeth that grew up into larger baby teeth it's like when your head got removed in wild at heart <laughs> it grew back like a reptile's <laughs> only with more teeth <laughs> after he chunks the captain off the ship two of the sisters from the dinner table that i before they come around they're from texas or something like how do y'all can we get a picture with you yeehaw 
Like, of course, ladies. Get in here. <laughs> Look at my teeth. Say cheese. And then they go on their merry way. On the their way to dinner, Jason Patrick and Sandra Bullock see Drew, the deaf girl's parents, bitching about the fact that she wore a dress that shows off her shoulders. Yeah, right. And the girl is just like, fuck you guys yeah. in sign language and storms off. That's just the middle finger, Bo. I know that one. Meanwhile, Willem Dafoe is issuing this order to shut down engines from his cabin, like it, doing his computer shit. And then everything in the bridge starts to freak out, like all the computer systems and stuff like that. And Boba Fett is like, um, I believe <laughs> the, uh, the ship has gone all higgledy piggledy. So, uh, we might need to check and see what's going on with the boat while this is happening jason patrick and sandra bullock are slow dancing on the middle of the ballroom and at this point we kind of cut back and forth between people having a good time in the evening and just the chaos of the ship shutting down jason patrick while they're dancing tells sandra bullock hey i had to leave you alone this morning because i needed to be alone for a little while and i know that seems like circular logic but <laughs> like they said hey do you want to shoot a shotgun and i was like well i can shoot a shotgun or i can shoot my love gun and between you and me i kind of want to shoot the shotgun more like sometimes you're just not in the mood sandra bullock that's all look i just want to say i can trust my gut about everything right that's the one thing in this world i can trust okay between you and me it's my gut and i gotta tell you my gut and my love gun and also the shotgun uh -huh. all three of us uh -huh. have never been more sure about anything in my oh life oh my god oh my god i can't believe this is happening oh my god what 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 just say it the answer is yes go but you have to ask first and then everything goes fucking crazy in this room and she's like no 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 i was about to lock this down <laughs> I, what i was gonna say was i think we should get married <laughs> <laughs> everything right. blows up yeah the crew's running all over the place ub40's on fire somewhere there are explosions in the engine room glass is shattering everywhere and then we get a shot of the propeller spinning and then the engines finally shut down yeah. like we are kind of dead in the water first mate boba fett says find the captain and then Willem Dafoe is down in his stateroom, giving himself a good leeching to relax, as one does when you're a crazy person. Throws back some pills, too. <laughs> That'll kick you back. Up in the dining room, plates are crashing, glasses smashing, fall to the floor, lights just fall off the ceiling, and Sandra Bullock says, this can't be happening! It's ruining my vacation! And you're just like, I think you're kind of the worst person in this movie. Lucy from Twin Peaks, aka the cruise director, is yelling, all is well, yeah. in the same way that <laughs> Kevin Bacon does in animal house <laughs> sandra bullock is like oh no i know everything's fucked up i think lucy from twin peaks is lying to us <laughs> the bridge is in chaos they have no communication with the outside world Bo boba fett is on the horn trying to get the coast guard on the line and the irish man is like you can't do it everything is down willem dafoe calls him up and he says ha -ha, first mate boba fett you need to sound the alarm and authorize an evacuation the captain's dead because i chucked him off the boat and then i took a picture with a fat lady from texas at her sister who's not as fat but she's from texas or maybe oklahoma i couldn't exactly pinpoint her accent and you need to get all the people off the ship and if you think i'm kidding look at the port side section c i'm gonna blow it up now <laughs> spider-man oh shit and, yeah and both of his like yeah um we can't just evacuate the ship so how about no smoke starts going everywhere because of his golf balls and while that is going down we also get a quick cutaway to see that drew is stuck in the elevator dude she's been in this elevator for a long time Bo. she stays there for a while too you think she just wrote it up and down <laughs> she was hitting all the buttons just making it stop on every floor i got in an elevator once when i was on vacation to tampa florida with my parents and my younger sister it was a two-story motel and i remember getting out of the pool and getting in the elevator and hitting floor two and the song betty davis eyes was playing and i just went up and down until that song ended because i really liked it i was a big kim Carnes fan <laughs> how could you not be betty davis eyes is a great song <laughs> it was a real bobby hill moment for me <laughs> <laughs> I like this song. So, Will <laughs> Defoe says, I said, sound the alarm or I'll burn it all <laughs> down. And Boba Fett is like, well, yep, all right. It seems like you are in charge. You're the captain now. Just like uh, that movie, uh, Captain Ron, um, <laughs> with Tom Hanks. And I'm going to uh, sound the alarm. And then we're going to tell everyone to uh, evacuate the ship, okay? You got 15 minutes to evacuate. And then I'm going to burn it all down. Fight him. 
<laughs> and so the the shitty parents of drew are like you know our daughter's been gone a long time and it seems as if we're in a kind of a titanic mm-hmm. situation here maybe we should go find her <laughs> she'll approach you anyway so <laughs> jason patrick being super detective is like hey uh do anybody else smell sulfur and I didn't even fought this time. Like, I haven't been eating eggs or nothing. So, but I'm pretty sure I smell sulfur. Any of you eating eggs? Anybody here? Did you maybe eat, like, go too hard on the scrambled eggs at the buffet this morning? Letting out some stinky egg farts? And they're like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, I'm just, I'm smelling sulfur is all. If anybody asks if you smell sulfur, you're immediately just looking around for who crop dusted the place. Like, who looks guilty? Right. Also, there has been extreme circumstances in this room. The probability of someone shitting their pants is very high. You get one guy with IBS and say, nope. That's not sulfur you smell. That is human excrement, my friend. And Jason Patrick is like, hey, I don't know, but something seems a little off here. And they're like, you mean like the fucking ship stopping unexpectedly? And then sounding the alarm to evacuate? Right. Boba Fett telling us that we got to get off the ship. Like, no, yeah, I guess that does seem strange. Yeah, that, that's a little weird, but it's something else. It's something else bigger than that. Is it the fire and the exploding electrical sparks? Man, I don't know. I don't know. It feels like something weird's going on here. I mean, I feel like that's part of it but uh, i'll tell you what i'm gonna go up to the bridge and just let myself in which is what he does he just busts at the bridge he's like yeah i think you guys think something weird's going on around here and they're like um first of all what are you doing up here you're not the captain that's willem defoe oops i've said too much yeah uh any of these fires been confirmed well yes i mean the instruments say there's fires And so did Willem Dafoe. Oops, sorry. Did I say that? That's two sources. If that's good enough for the New York Times, it's good enough for me. That's called cooperating sources. And it's what I learned in journalism school before I became a captain. Um, sir, who are you? Relax, I'm LAPD. One of the crew members (laughs) says, what the hell does that mean? You're what? I'm afraid we're in international waters. So you're the officer of nothing (laughs) right now. I have as much authority as you do and more because I'm wearing this suit. Down in the ship's vault or somewhere secure, Willem Dafoe enters in and he just starts heisting all the jewels. We still don't know who he is or what he's doing. He's just a guy who's got golf bombs. Drew's mother and father are inconsolable because they're upset that they made fun of their daughter's punky Brewster outfit that she was wearing to make her go run off to the elevator. And Sandra Bullock comes over and she says, Hey, you shitty parents. (laughs) Hey, aren't you? the shitty parents of that girl who was trying to hit on my boyfriend and the mother's like oh my god you're the star of speed to cruise control you have to help us okay right i guess i'll help you out if i can and her first pitch is to try to get out of doing anything it's like i bet she's on another boat wait hold on there she is over there drew <laughs> drew she just waved back um our daughter's deaf she signed back does that make you happy she gave me the middle finger so she seems fine to me yeah she said i was number one and the middle finger means i'm really number one right (laughs) like i'm especially number one (laughs) jason patrick shows up just in time for these parents to start yelling for their daughter and boba fett is just like um yeah you're missing your your daughter i understand that but you need to get in the boat and we'll look for the daughter if we see a small girl that looks like she can't hear we'll send her your way jason patrick is like yeah i don't know something fishy about this fire and all that fart smell listen uh boba fett um what if i go looking around for the fire maybe and boba fett's like well let me stop you right there We've only got a few more seconds before Willem Dafoe turns on the engines again, and I don't know what he's capable of. Well, who's capable of? What did you just say? Oh, damn it, Boba Fett. I'm always revealing the villain. Yes, Willem Dafoe, I don't know who he is or what he's capable of, but he is definitely running the ship. Did he have really tiny teeth and never watch his golf? Pointy chin like a letter opener? Cheekbones look like he's smuggling little walnuts below his eyes? You know, let me stop you there. We never talked about sports, and I haven't seen him with my eyes yet. 
I will say he's got the kind of voice I would associate with someone with little chiclet teeth. But I can't say that for sure because I haven't seen it. The engines fire back up as the last lifeboat isn't in the water yet. So one of the cables snaps free and then Jason Patrick grabs Sandra Bullock and he yanks her back onto the ship. And then the winch gets jammed according to a crew member who shouts out, the winch must be jammed. And then long story short, Jason Patrick jumps into the action. He frees the cable and then the passengers are dangling in the boat and then sandra bullock says do i have to do every goddamn thing i'll be right back so she jumps out and pulls around the gangplank and then the people from the dangling lifeboat climb back on the ship dante is there in the mix oh yeah i forgot about him he falls in the water right like jason patrick's big solution to this is to like hey what if we throw this rope and tie it to the boat to the ship so it doesn't fall it's like why didn't you start with that why did you start with like we're gonna throw a rope ladder down to these civilians and then i'm gonna leap from the deck onto the boat start with the rope and start throwing it down the rope hey why don't you tie this rope to the top of the boat so nobody falls off and dies and whatnot oh one of them dead anyway sorry <laughs> back in the elevator drew goes full spider-man so that she can do battle with willem dafoe later and she shimmies her way out of the elevator the irish crew member calls boba fett and he says hi ted hoy this ship is aimed right for the cliffs probably the cliffs are dover boba fett is like Oh boy, this is going to be a real going down with the ship situation. You're the Captain Neo. <laughs> I'm going to give you this hat, and now I'm going to go get in one of the boats. Hand me that wig and that dress. <laughs> it's in that box that says, in case of emergency break. I'm going to do what's called a Billy Zane, <laughs> and I'm going to sneak on to one of the lifeboats. <laughs> but before he can get into his wig and dress, a la Medea, Jason Patrick is, is, comes onto the bridge yet again because this is just his playground now. And he's like, I got an idea. Like, he's got to be controlling this ship somehow, so I wonder if there's like a transmitter or something. So he starts looking around and in the largest leap of logic that Detective Dum Dum <laughs> takes in this movie, he's like, yeah, I bet those fires are just smoke grenades. Golf ball sized grenades? Who's got golf balls on this ship? Let me think for a minute. The actual line is him going, yeah, these look like little balls, 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 golf balls, Giga. What? <laughs> when did Jason Patrick become Hercule Poirot on this ship? Um, anyway. <laughs> so Jason Patrick and this Irish man Eight, decides they're gonna bust out the skeet guns because as we pointed out there are live shotguns on this cruise ship we could use these to kill people if we needed to oh i am definitely gonna shoot somebody with this i am so glad these are on the boat they make their way down to willem defoe's stateroom and they go inside and they see all of his wires and computers and stuff and then they open up the closet and they find ashton the stateroom attendant just hiding there I'm like why is he in the closet and also where's sandra bullock during all this i think she's still up on the deck just kind of hanging out <laughs> getting a little breath of fresh air uh-huh just taking a stroll on the promenade and uh, they'll, like they see all the computer shit that willem defoe's got in his room and whatnot then jason patrick goes into the bathroom where he sees the bathtub full of leeches a lot more than we saw in those two jars yeah maybe they're mating oh yeah they they breed like rabbits <laughs> he says oh boy this giga is one sick puppy and then giger chimes in because he's got his room wired up and he's like, so you think I'm sick? You think I'd be doing this if I had my health? I designed this whole computer system. Let me ask you something, Alex, if that is your name. I don't know if I ever asked you before. Have you ever had a false sense of security? Huh, false sense of security? What could he be getting at? Oh boy, he's gonna blow something up. He looks over at the laptop and it says, Goodbye, Jason Patrick, a.k.a. Alex. And the whole room just explodes. Yeah. Why is Willem Dafoe personally attacking Jason Patrick in this movie? He hasn't talked to him. He doesn't know him. He has no history with him. It's a good question. How does he know his name? How does he know Sandra Bullock's name? I, I guess Sandra Bullock, when she was talking to him at the bar, you know, in that one scene where he's not watching golf, she was like, Hey, 
That's my boyfriend, Jason Patrick. And I'm Sandra Bullock. And we're here. No, we're not married. We're just here to do a bunch of fucking and maybe celebrate the fact that we've been together seven months. Isn't that a weird anniversary to celebrate? <laughs> I said so. But Jason Patrick said he wants to celebrate every month. Also, he said that he is 300 months old. <laughs> the remaining passengers head to the top of the ship. And then Drew's mom goes over to Sandra Bullock and says, Sandra Bullock, they won't go looking for my daughter. But I saw Speed 1. You're a strong female lead. Go find my daughter. Even though she told you that she wished you were dead and she wanted to marry Keanu Reeves' older, less handsome brother. Also, we haven't mentioned this yet, but Drew's mother is played by Lois Childs, who was Holly Goodhead in Moonraker, starring Roger Moore, your favorite James Bond. One of them, yeah. certainly, in the top five or six, however many there have been. Holly Goodhead. That's almost <laughs> as stupid as a lot of Fachina. <laughs> so stupid. All of a sudden, Jason Patrick decides that he's going to figure out some way to stop the shit and boba fett is like first of all i'm going to send my irish friend with you please make sure he doesn't actually hurt the shit we're on the hook for a lot of money here and a lot of liability so how about you just cluck him on the head with a wrench or something if you get the opportunity so they run off to do a bunch of bullshit to shut down the engines and find geiger yeah who I keep calling Giger because of the movie Alien. I just refer to him as Willem Dafoe because I didn't even know that was the bad guy's name in this. Sandra Bullock starts to hear a bunch of banging and decides that she's going to go investigate with Dante. Yeah. And she discovers a bunch of the passengers that are stuck on the ship trapped by this fire door, but Drew isn't with them, even though she is now tasked with finding this poor girl. Mm -mm. Our fat guy in the movie is like, hey, over the door, there's a bunch of fat ladies in here. <laughs> I mean, normal size women, not fat women at all. Oh shit, I am not getting sex ever again. There's a lot of jokes in this that fall into that warrant warrant category, and tonally, it kind of disrupts the attempts to kind of build the tension and action because it's just not a very good movie. Right, it doesn't help that the action scenes kind of fall flat most of the time. Yeah, almost all of the time they don't really work. Even in this scene where these passengers are trapped, Sandra Bullock is like, "I gotta find a way to get them out of there," and then she just pulls a chainsaw out of nowhere like why is a chainsaw readily available on a cruise ship because all the shotguns were upstairs shad <laughs> she pulls it out and gives it a groovy that's for you evil dead fans out there i wouldn't have been surprised if that happened it would have been pretty good she cuts down the door with a chainsaw and the passengers get out we do see that drew makes her way out of the elevator shaft i kind of felt like the character drew was going to be more important in this movie kind of like newt in aliens like maybe yeah. her character would have been someone that sandra bullock and jason patrick would bond over showing that they could be good parents if they ever decided to make a baby themselves or you know kidnap one like raising arizona she's just a complete damsel in distress though she's just somebody that they both have to save at different times well a little later that lolita shows up well yeah. she throws it out there and you're like where is this coming from we'll get to that let's just save all that because right, it right. is truly one of the most bizarre things in this film so jason patrick and this irish first mate find the control room and jason patrick his whole plan is it's a real getter kind of thing where he's just like hey how about i just stop banging on stuff and pushing a bunch of buttons will this stop the ship and the irish guy's like hey toy you're not doing nothing all you're doing what is hitting a bunch of buttons that don't do shit? Yeah, yeah, what do you know? Look, look, that one turned red. Now it's white. Now it's red. Now it's white. It's doing something. And then Jason Patrick says, well, maybe we can't stop Willem Dafoe's program. Maybe we can fool it. I got a plan. We're on a boat, right? What's the last thing that Willem Dafoe is expecting anybody to do? Flood the ship. <laughs> Good plan, right? And immediately this first mate is like, hey, Detroit, let me call up to the bridge. Hey, Boba Fett, this crazy son of a bitch is flooding the whole boat. <laughs> and uh, uh, fortunately for Jason Patrick, nobody answers. And so <laughs> Jason Patrick is just like, hey, if you don't flood this boat, I'm going to punch you right in the face. I got a glass jaw. I can't be taking no punches from a fake Keanu Reeves. So that's what they do. They go to flood the yeah. ship. But then Jason Patrick looks up on a security camera and he's like, hey, that's that little girl. What no sign language like me? I got to go save her. And so he runs off to go save Drew because she's down in the part of the ship that's about to get flooded. He runs down there. Water comes rushing in. They kind of go swimming down the hallway. Meanwhile, the Irish first mate is like, hi, he told me to flood the ship. 
Now he's showing me to stop flooding the ship. I wish that fake Keanu Reeves would get his story straight. <laughs> also, time check in watching this movie. We're halfway through it. And I guarantee you, loyal listeners, we are not halfway through this episode. We're about to wrap this thing up real fast. But it is shocking there is half the movie left at this point. Yeah, because nothing has really happened. All you've done in this movie so far is revealed who the villain is, who's taken over the ship. But this is, you know, sort of the problem with Under Siege 2 of you've got this premise that you're not doing anything fun with right it was like it's die hard on a cruise ship okay well i'm done and now the money it, it's really a bummer but yeah so coffee burrito okay <laughs> what do you want to i'm look i don't execute i'm a big idea guy blue sky that's me all right uber for space boom make it happen all right <laughs> uber for space <laughs> edible tattoos go do that how would that even work Underwear that's its own toilet paper. Go do it. I think they've already invented that. I've seen it a time or two. It's just underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Jason Patrick and this little girl end up in the laundry room, I think is where they uh, are. They're down there where the flooding happens on a ship, which isn't a thing, I don't think. They end up riding these hooks carrying bags of either laundry or <laughs> dead bodies to safety. And this is the Foy Chad where they finally get out of this room and they're they're safe and everything and drew starts signing to jason patrick again uh -huh. because jason patrick is the kind of guy who like moves his lip when he reads <laughs> he also has to say out loud what is being signed to him that's because we in the audience we wouldn't know what the hell's going on although they could use subtitles that would have made sense it's still stupid my wife told me when she was in high school she competed and she was doing a scene from the miracle worker uh -huh. with a friend of hers and she she just made up the sign language. And like, if I had a time machine, I know exactly <laughs> where and when I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. It's kind of like when Tom and Jerry were doing a sketch on a piano keyboard and somehow Tom's fingers ended up tied together in knots. It always sort of ends in that configuration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's right. <laughs> so Drew is signing to Jason Patrick and he's like, okay, so if anything happens to us, you want me to know you love me and you will be 15 soon. Ooh. <laughs> oh boy, this is a real dicey area for me. Um, do you happen to live in Louisiana? <laughs> <laughs> are you in a southern state where that is less frowned upon how cool are your parents do you think that they would see a cop as a successful guy <laughs> or will they be disappointed also i am on the suicide squad the young lady who plays drew in this she was actually a deaf actress she only made a couple of movies or something now she teaches uh sign language in canada far more valuable than making a movie like speed too sure. so good for her i wish i could remember remember her name so i give her a shout out but she ain't never gonna hear this well for more <laughs> reasons than you think and then jason patrick <laughs> says well you know relationships based on extreme circumstances rarely work out that's what my girlfriend said in a scene that i wasn't in and there was no way for me to hear have you seen the movie lolita yeah i was watching it just last night. oh you're not gonna trap me that way <laughs> you are one sneaky little girl do you enjoy the films of roman polanski yeah i i, I thought that uh you know fearless vampire killers was under air. whoa do you like woody allen's style of comedy i do look i saw that documentary i i'm not <laughs> touching nothing listen i gotta take you back to your parents before one thing leads to another and we are doing boogieing my idol is lisa marie presley look i'm not saying you're not on the right side of the quinceanera okay <laughs> but i'm just saying it's frowned upon so willem defoe he's still downstairs stealing jewels and diamonds and treasure and then jason patrick and drew they catch up with the rest of the passengers sandra bullock immediately starts ripping into jason patrick why did you leave me upstairs what's going on what's going on with this are we serious are you seeing someone else is that that little girl who's 15 years old who keeps licking her fingers at you and then she asked chad what if we just abandoned in ship right now what if we just jump over the side and that's where dante's like yeah we'd be sucked into the propellers and all of us would die she's like oh yeah i guess that would be terrible all right well so what do we do and this is where jason patrick is like hey you remember that giga guy that you were had the hots for at the bar yeah the one with all the little tiny white teeth golf balls leech marks all over his skin 
I remember him. Turns out he took over the whole ship and he what? designed the software that makes the boat go. What? Yeah, Gaga's everywhere. He sounds really smart. How much money do you think he pulls down? More than a motorcycle detective? Let me ask you something. If like we broke up because you were into him, how would you feel if I dated someone maybe a little bit younger than you? You mean 32? Um, you know. 31? It would be divisible by 30. <laughs> Three? No. No. But like, let's say if I were going to, you know, send her resume to Barely Legal magazine. I would want to wait, let's say, three years to do it. <laughs> Jason Patrick, he goes chasing after Willem Dafoe. He finds him in a hallway, and Jason Patrick pulls the skeet shotgun on our movie's bad guy, and Willem Dafoe just pulls a handheld computer device at Jason Patrick, and he says, Be cool, baby! It's not a gun, it's a computer! Your girlfriend is a looker! It'd be a shame if something happened to her! And he's like, what are you talking about? I got a gun, I'm just gonna shoot you, which he should just shoot the guy. But he doesn't, and then, as you you mentioned earlier willem dafoe just whips out his nintendo power glove and just clickety 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 click and then closes a the door in front of jason patrick like they're on the enterprise yeah it's totally an enterprise move i have closed the door captain susan's laughing at that joke because <laughs> yeah. that's the enterprise <laughs> reference with star trek hell i know that <laughs> i'll tell you what susan and i have had a lot of star trek conversations <laughs> because i recently got into uh next generation and she's like what about my spock tattoo and i'm like i gotta be honest more of a picard guy <laughs> did she punch you of course she did but only until i started crying that's my defense mechanism is that i start crying so much that the person hitting <laughs> me feels such shame <laughs> on my behalf you know and like the like the pity and disgust and revulsion they feel <laughs> kind of lowers their defenses I, and that's when i run i walked past her the all the other day and i went bitty bitty and she punched me in the stomach oh yeah oh yeah no <laughs> God forbid you should be like, you know what's good in, on Star Trek? The Jawas. She will send your head into the vending machine. We gotta find more interns like her. I, I had to go to the dentist because of her. <laughs> she's, she's giving us the fingers right now. The middle fingers. She thinks we're both number one. Yeah, we can see you through the glass. <laughs> I get it. I get it, but like, he brought it up. Just remember when we walk out of here who target number one is. That's right. Remember who doesn't sign the paycheck you don't get. Yeah. Rem <laughs> hey, remember who actually said that he likes Star Trek? <laughs> Wasn't me. Yeah, right. Right. Right, Susan. <laughs> I even know the abbreviations. TOS, TNG, DS9. <laughs> W-G-A-S. What? Who gives a shit? Oh, <laughs> Susan, get him. Ah, no, the door's locked. Neither in the show, Susan. <laughs> But besides, we he's got to be he's got to have recovery time because he's not gonna be able to talk for like three or four days. <laughs> Where are we in our movie? Uh -oh. oh yeah, so after uh, Willem Dafoe gets away and Jason Patrick is chasing after him, yeah, yeah, Jason Patrick ends up in like the party room where he's just scanning the place with shotgun akimbo ready to go, <laughs> and then Willem Dafoe's face somehow appears on the screen where he's like, ah, eh, you know the computers gave me cancer what and jason patrick starts shooting the tv screens which shows a fundamental misunderstanding of how tv technology works where he's like oh my god he's in the screens it's getting so huge he's becoming a giant just like that ghost of christmas future and scrooge you're not really shooting me because that's not how televisions work you stupid son of a bitch and then willem dafoe says all this crazy shit about like while i was designing their software what they didn't know was all the the computer waves were giving me blood cancer or something. Yeah, it gave me copper poisoning. I'm a smart guy. And the company just dropped me. Now I use leeches to suck the copper poison. And I steal jewels. And I invested in Bitcoin and NFTs and Ivermectin. <laughs> It's crazy, Chad. The whole premise of this movie is that computers gave this guy copper blood poisoning. That leeches can suck out of his body. And so he has taken over this ship after he got fired because the company found out that he had bad blood and was like, well, fuck this guy. Right. Get rid of him. Get us a, some new blood that we can poison. And he's stealing jewels to do 
What? To be rich for his remaining <laughs> years, I guess? Does he have a fence lined up? He's only going to get a percentage of the cost of those jewels. Willem Dafoe, he gets away and he closes some more doors that trap Jason Patrick near the gift shop. And then a bomb goes off. Sandra Bullock hears music playing near the gift shop and so she knows where Jason Patrick is. And she runs up there because he's in trouble. It's all incredibly convoluted to try to explain. When she arrives, she gets there and she's with Boba Fett and it turns out there's a grenade attached to the door if they open it it's gonna blow people up and with jason patrick's help she takes one of boba fett's shoelaces and ties it around the grenade or something with the handle so it won't go off and then she takes out the pin because you got to do that and then they just remove it and after she pulls it out she's like oh my god where to go where to go and he's like um you've got it in your hands right there <laughs> um it looks like a thermal detonator that i used to see on tatooine that's a star wars reference <laughs> susan susan is, he's boba fett don't even give me that look and so yeah i think it goes off or something it doesn't matter no. it makes a little explosion in any way but to your point it's another action sequence that they set up that just kind of falls flat it doesn't do anything speaking of not doing anything willem dafoe is just running around the hallways of this ship uh -huh. and he gets a little bing bong message on his power glove yep. hey the ship changed course and he's like, ah, no, it won't. And then he does something, end of scene. Yeah. We have finally reunited Drew with her parents. And immediately she's like, hey, where is that real tasty morsel, <laughs> Jason Patrick? We've got a thing happening. By the way, we're getting married, mom and dad. He's a cop. I hope you don't mind. I know it's not the career that you would have picked for my future husband, <laughs> but that's what he is. And I love him. And they're like, uh, what happened below decks? <laughs> Mom, dad, remember when you showed me Rosemary's baby and I asked you a lot of questions about the director? <laughs> that. Also, it's not a crime if you have sex with someone his age in international waters. I know. I looked that up in a book. When we get back to shore, I'm going to need you to sign some paperwork <laughs> outside the ship jason patrick sandra bullock and boba fett they see that the ship is now headed directly to an oil tanker why are we headed towards an oil tanker i don't know jason patrick says hey maybe we could do something to the propeller of the ship oh i got it we could flood the propeller of the ship and they're like well the propeller is already in the ocean ah i gotta come up with a better idea then. sandra bullock here suggests like what if we drop a wrench in the engine to break it because i did that with my car one time and that worked that's where Jason Patrick is like, wait, I got a better idea. Yeah, the propeller's underwater and that presents a problem. But what if we throw a big ass rope into the propeller like I used to do with my brother when he was riding his bike and I would stick a stick in the spokes and then he would go fly it over the front and he would bust up his face and dislocate his arm and then I would really laugh. And the Irish crew member says, hi, to toy. How about a steel cable? That'd be even stronger. All right, so that's what they go do. We cut to the crew on the oil tanker. They look up and they're like, uh-oh. And then, for some reason, stateroom attendant Ashton, he shows up to remind us he's in the movie. Yeah. Down on the lower deck, Jason Patrick, he climbs out on this platform beside the ship with Sandra Bullock, and there's this emotional moment between the two. And then Jason Patrick, he puts on scuba gear, grabs some thick mooring rope cable, and then he gets tethered to the ship with a separate yellow rope. And then Jason mm -hmm. Patrick says, 4296589J, that's my badge number. I'll be right back, baby. That's also the secret code I use with that 15 year old girl to love let me know that her parents gave me the thumbs up jason patrick goes into the water and heads to the propeller of the ship and he tosses the cable in it now it feels very james bondish the filmmakers do show that jason patrick is doing his own stunts with lots of slow motion so that you can really see his face and then uh, during this sequence the rope goes into the propeller and it all gets chopped up and then they pull him out it, right it's a really boring action sequence like i understand like on paper like oh he's gotta swim under the ship and throw this thing into the propeller but just there's no sense of danger at any point uh -uh. and all, also it doesn't help that this character is grossly stupid yeah they start pulling him up but willem dafoe has gotten wind of their shenanigans and shows up at the back of the boat oh no you didn't <laughs> 
yeah he pulls his gun and this is where he explains about all the leeches and copper in his blood and that kind of thing jason patrick is like hey how about you let everybody go and then there's a chance that i won't kill you but willem is standing on the platform and jason patrick is just floating in the water down below Mm -hmm. the bad guy has a gun and the high ground and an excessive amount of teeth in his mouth well and in fairness willem defoe just kind of laughs at him all right let the rope go let him dangle and so jason patrick goes into the water and then boba fett is like um so what do i do then and like it's a sarlacc pit willem dafoe just kicks boba fett into the water i know susan (laughs) he was boba fett i'm gonna talk about the sarlacc pit And so he goes into the water as well, (laughs) and Willem Dafoe then grabs Sandra Bullock for insurance. Uh Uh-huh. You're coming with me, Mary Jane. I mean, Sandra Bullock. (laughs) But Sandra Bullock gets knocked to the ground for a second, and she kind of surreptitiously starts the winch for the smaller rope that's tied to Jason Patrick. Yeah, so he gets pulled back up as opposed to going towards the propeller? Or just left behind or whatever. But anyway, and on his way back up he also grabs boba fett and pulls him onto the the ship yeah this is all terribly boring (laughs) speaking (laughs) of chad here's a thing that don't matter so the tanker the people on the bridge of the tanker are freaking out hey we've got to get this slow ass boat moving so pull up the anchor (laughs) Uh, all right meanwhile jason patrick and boba fett are now back on board the ship jason patrick takes off his shirt to show off his sculpted chest yeah here's one for the ladies (laughs) Or for some of the fellows out there. I think, statistically speaking, one out of nine. Uh, Boba Fett is like, yeah, I I think I heard that uh, Willem Dafoe was taking your girlfriend to the marina. So maybe you want to go down there and get a smaller boat and chase him. But I've hurt my arm, so I'm just going to stay on board this ship. So see it uh, towards the end of the movie then. And then Willem Dafoe and Sandra Bullock, they hop on this shell of a boat that has two jet skis plugged into it. Like it's powered Mm -hmm. by jet skis. And then he ties Sandra Bullock's hands together. And then they just blast off the back of the cruise ship. And then Jason Patrick tries to save him, but he failed. So he goes back up to the bridge of the ship to watch them crash into this oil rig. When they take off, Jason Patrick tries to like jump down to stop them and dante just happens to be there to help him up and i'm like wait was dante there the whole time no is he just hiding in the back of the boat until all this sorts itself out just passing by taking some action shots yeah and so boba fett is now back on the bridge and he's radioing for jason patrick this is where the passengers notice oh wait there's a big ass boat in front of us Uh uh-oh this seems bad (laughs) we're not slowing down you might have to to tell me what's going on here because boba fett starts to give jason patrick a bunch of instructions on how to do something with a bilge pump and a shaft i think he's releasing water on one side to make the ship lean to the right so that it'll bank which is what the ship does it banks to the right it ends up just broadsiding the oil tank if i may chad let me give you a, a brief snippet of my notes from this portion of the film sure jason patrick and dante swim underwater to get to the place to do the thing this movie is so boring (laughs) so they don't crash into the oil tanker everyone cheers and the movie really gives you a bit of a head fake like that's it movie's over and then the cruise ship starts heading towards saint martin and then we get this sequence of oh shits where first jason patrick looks up and sees where the ship's headed and he says oh shit and then you see all of the ship's crew and they all say oh shit and then all of the passengers who are still alive say oh shit and then drew signs oh shit and everyone says oh shit because we're all headed towards the island and we're all gonna die again and there are some glamour shots of people in the town swimmers boaters all just enjoying beach life the cruise ship almost runs down a sailboat which by the way the people on the sailboat are like hey we had the right away right which is like a tonka truck yelling at a semi to look out where it's going they hit that sailboat and that thing explodes yeah that's pretty like good it blows up and on the bridge jason patrick is like hey what if we drop all the incas and boba fett is like um yeah we're 
traveling too fast and if we drop the anchor it won't work I'm pretty sure it's gonna work. I mean, who's the LAPD <laughs> captain around here? So he just slaps the big button that has an anchor shape on it. And the anchor falls down and starts dragging on the ground. And it does start to slow the ship down to 10 knots or miles per hour or 10 something for something per hour. Yeah, we've got a counter, you know, a, a speedometer essentially for the ship, which will... Which is crazy for a movie called Speed 2 that the finale of it isn't about going fast it's about going slow you would think that somebody on the crew or in the production office would have pointed that out but here we are they try to drop a second anchor but it gets stuck and then the ship just runs over this old man in a dinghy helping a couple of buddies scuba dive and these two scuba divers come up and the cruise ship just runs them over presumably killing them there's i seriously doubt they live through that also jason patrick's genius anchor plan results in one of the anchors getting yanked out of the side of the (laughs) ship and then he's like um what about if we drop the other one and boba fett is like yeah That one stuck, and even if it weren't, I would say no, because of how it blew up part of the ship. We get more ships being crashed into, and more sailboats getting crushed, I mean exploded. Um, We get to see Jason Patrick really do nothing. He mostly just watches what happens the way a hero should in a movie like this. And then the cruise ship crashes into some water skiers and wakeboarders and some shrimpers. There's people on little foot pedal boats. Where are Sandra Bullock and Willem Dafoe during all of this mayhem? They're gone. Uh, We don't see them for a couple of minutes here. No, it's a while man because you get the big finale before you see them again speaking of which let's just get to it here our ship smashes into the dock of saint martin and crushes this scale model like a tin can and it is fantastic all the passengers on the ship they're screaming glasses exploding jason patrick and boba fett they get thrown out the windshield down to some lower deck the ship crashes through a hotel where two people are fucking it runs over a delivery truck there's a little dog from fraser running around trying not to get killed but at the end of the day chat like nobody on the ship can do anything to stop this no and so they're just watching it like we are yeah until the thing just comes to rest and then leans over a little bit and then dante is the one who's like um we're saved And they are. Jason Patrick, he hurries down to the water to go after Willem Dafoe. We see that Sandra Bullock's hands are still tied together. And she's still on the two jet ski things on the little boat contraption. And she yanks on this lever, which releases Willem Dafoe, who is on one of the jet skis. And he kind of zips off. So now she's on her jet ski attached to this boat frame. And Willem Dafoe is on his jet ski. And he's carrying the jewels in a backpack. So far, so good? So far, so good. Then as things like this happen in movies like this jason patrick just runs over to some random guy who's on a date with his girlfriend yeah and the guy's like uh, yeah i just bought a condo here jason patrick says i don't have time to argue with you i gotta go get my girl i, I, I wasn't really arguing this is my girl I'll, I'll drive my boat you do what i say i'm lapd i already agreed to help you just get in my boat and so they take off after the jet skis and then sandra bullock just starts firing flares into the sky so that jason patrick will know where she is to come save her and sure enough he sees it and, but here's the part of the movie that gets really stupid <laughs> Oh, this is the part? Okay. This finale is just dopey. The post-finale finale. finale. The cruise ship crashing into St. Martin's should have been the end of this movie. And you figure out how to tie that into Willem Dafoe and all that stuff. And instead, we've got not a car chase, a boat chase. Turns out that's still boring as shit. Well, then let's turn it into something else, Bo. So Jason Patrick takes this like harpoon fishing rod (laughs) yes that this dude who owns the boat has Uh uh-huh and fires it at the seaplane that willem dafoe oh wait we forgot to mention willem dafoe grabs sandra bullock off of her jet ski somehow yeah and yanks her into a random seaplane that he just commandeers because he's lapd maybe he's forced her onto a a seaplane jason patrick has harpooned the skid of this thing and just gets yanked out of the boat because it turns out planes are faster than boats how did you expect him to water ski behind this yes a hundred percent but he doesn't it's so disappointing 
it really is. It's like, how did you not? And wh- why did California Girls not play when he did it? <laughs> he ends up using the recoil mechanism on the harpoon gun to pull himself up to the pontoon of this seaplane. One of the best parts of Willem Dafoe in this movie, this is maybe my favorite thing that he does in the film, is when he sees Jason Patrick slowly reeling himself towards the seaplane, he goes, oh, you little shit. That's pretty good. <laughs> I was so worried you were going to say it's the part where he repeatedly punches Sandra Bullock in the face. No, but Sandra Bullock throws his bag of jewels uh-huh. out of the seaplane. And that's where, yeah, Willem Dafoe gives her a smack for her troubles for that one. <laughs> and then Jason Patrick makes it to this plane, uh-huh. climbs onto the skid, uh-huh. opens Sandra Bullock's door, punches Willem Dafoe, grabs her, and then re- uses like a release or something. Well, I, no, under his feet, it says like, this is not a step. And I think the weight of both of them on it causes it to break free. And they crash down in the water and they're sitting on top of it like one of those big banana floats that they'll yank you around in the Bahamas on. Yeah. And so with them free Willem Dafoe is like what the fuck and then recovers in time to see that he's about to fly into a boat it's no it's not a boat he's about to fly into the oil tanker right and so he pulls hard on on the stick barely misses crashing head on into this tanker but then he's kind of gloating a little bit like hey hey, you can't catch me spider-man i mean jason patrick (laughs) and looks up in time to see that one of the mass of the tanker is directly in front of him rips through part of the plane and basically pins him like he's the angel on a christmas tree (laughs) at the top of this mast yes and it also gives enough time where the crew on the oil tanker they're like abandoned ship abandoned ship yes again abandoned we know you just got back on because of the guys really abandon abandon ship guys seriously yeah for realsies this time this is not a drill i know we said it wasn't a drill the first time But this time it's really, really not a drill. So they all get off the ship and then the thing just blows up. With Willem Dafoe cackling. Should have been more of that. And when we say that it blows up, the plane explodes in its Christmas tree angel position. This sets off a fireball. It's like the Hindenburg times 10 on water it is just black and orange and yellow exploding in all directions. It's like the Death Star exploding. Susan. (laughs) Memo, that was not me. (laughs) This is just all going to be like when she edits this, it is going to be her voice cut in. It's just like when the original Enterprise exploded. You can use that voice, Susan. Feel free to use that voice. (laughs) Right. The guy on the boat and his girlfriend come over and save Jason Patrick and Sandra Bullock. And then the guy on the boat, he scoops up the backpack full of jewels, which by the way, no one knows what's in that backpack, Bo. That guy just like scored millions of dollars worth of stolen goods. He makes a comment about finding it in international waters, Chad. Yeah finders keepers how does jason patrick know what's in that he doesn't right and this guy in particular doesn't because unless there was a scene where sandra bullock told jason patrick that we didn't see and then later jason patrick told this guy in a scene we didn't see as they were chasing after yeah but how would sandra bullock know she never saw the look in the bag only we the audience saw him stealing all this stuff right it's this whole chain of stuff that would have had to have happened off screen so they pull him into the boat so frustrating and then jason patrick fishes around into his pants and he pulls out that engagement ring that he had the night that he threw up all over himself in the stateroom (laughs) scrapes puke off of it and he's like "Eh, uh, how about you wear this you know for a few years and she's like for how long he's like i don't know 50 60 She's like, we'll see. We'll say 50, but it's got to be more like five. Hold on. She's 15 now. 16, 17, eight, about three and a half years. About <laughs> two and a half. I, w- <laughs> I want to allow for a courtship period. So let's say, I don't know, 30 months. <laughs> And then the 
movie pretty much ends. Only it doesn't yet again, Chad. We get a little stinger with Sandra Bullock back in her quirky yellow Volkswagen thing. Comedy legend Tim Conway waddles up and he sees that it's time to give her a driver's test again. And then she pulls out in her car and a city bus speeds by really fast and Sandra Bullock says, that bus is going way too fast. And I felt like this entire scene was something they took from the opening sequence and tacked it on to the end just to give the audience mm. It's a little good night kiss of Sandra Bullock to take home as a souvenir. I guess it's so dumb. And and she lets this bus go pass, past. She says the thing about, hey, remember that much better movie Speed? And then she makes a left turn and the screen goes black. You hear a crash. Oh, I turned it off before that happened. The movie does actually end at that point. This, like all terrible things, eventually ends. <sighs> Oh, that one's done. <laughs> Man, Speed 2 sucks, Chad. I still don't know if it's going to be our bottom. We got a lot of trash lined up. Yeah, but Chad, oh. we are not nearly done with this season of Die Hard related films. No. And speaking of bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Let me have it. What if, uh -huh. let, let me paint you a little mind picture I'm here. What if you take Sylvester Stallone right? at roughly the peak of his career? Right. Team him up with Dolly Parton. Nope, and, nope. And you do My Fair Lady with country music? Nope, that's Rhinestone. That's, <laughs> we'll get to that. In our upcoming season, Hello Dolly, featuring six movies. All oh, sorry, Dolly Parton. <laughs> That aren't the best little whorehouse in Texas. Or 9 to 5. 9 to 5 is a good movie. Dan <laughs> Coleman, very funny in 9 to 5. So it's Sylvester Stallone, height of his action hero powers. Yes. Coupled with another fantastic actor Ooh. who also has made something of a career of playing villains. I like this. And it's a diehard knockoff? And it's a diehard knockoff. The villain will be played by none other than John Lithgow. Oh, 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 oh. what movie is this? It is the rock climbing diehard ripoff extravaganza cliffhanger. Oh. Featuring <laughs> that lady from Northern Exposure, that guy from The Waltons, and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. So <laughs> buckle up, or as the poster for Cliffhanger once threatened slash told us, hang on, because it is it's time for us to uh, go into the mountains to the snowy peaks where the Noah Emmerich can be a snowboarder and <laughs> and crazy shenanigans happen with bats and explosives and a guy with a knife and also Dr. Phil or a reasonable facsimile thereof. <laughs> so if you come back in two weeks time, you will get to have all of that from Mr. Bo Ransville and myself. As always, like, rate, review. You can email us at pig six movies at gmail.com you can leave a review you can tell us what you like about the show you can keep what you don't like about the show to yourself nobody wants to hear that kind of talk Bo, any final thoughts that you have on what movie was this speed Two cruise control how soon i forget what we're talking about why did jason patrick the moment that little girl said i love you shut it down <laughs> like no look i <laughs> i get it you're a little girl but under no circumstances instead of equivocating with you know relationships that start with extreme <laughs> circumstances generally don't last i'm not saying it would last i'm saying generally it doesn't last that's because he had a four pack of wine coolers some benadryl and condoms upstairs oh my god a real jesus juice cocktail <laughs> happening <laughs> Ugh. Gross. Yuck. Susan, edit all that stuff out. We don't want to sound like weirdos. She's not going to edit it out. All right. She still thinks we're number one, Bo. That's why we love you, Susan. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> so are we watching Voyager at your place? No, I'm not allowed at your place. Okay. I'll watch it myself. <laughs> we'll see everyone in two weeks' time with Cliffhanger. Ugh. Hang on. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.